Thank you so much, and thanks to The Strand, one of the last great bookstores in uh, America. Um, I believe in books, and I believe in buying books. Uh, and all of you had to come, and you either had to buy my book, or you had to pay $15 to come in. So you're really, really devoted. But you know, I learned from my father how to um, sell and how to seduce people. So these are free giveaways. For, <laughs> and it's an American artist who, uh, Gabby, you can do the next picture. It's an American artist who lives in Paris, and she does these wonderful, wonderful um, maps of different neighborhoods of Paris. So that um, I thought in uh, a little bit of an exchange, as we say in French, a partage, uh, for coming here tonight, here's a little bit of my street for you. And uh, if you look over in the corner near Metro Saint-Georges, you'll find someone that looks like me except with red hair. <laughs> so, so this is a book about a love affair. Uh, it's a mad, passionate, all-consuming, never-ending love affair with a street. And I'm glad to be able to celebrate this uh, tonight <clears throat> with so many people from so many different uh, areas and uh, eras of my life. And I'm not going to mention everybody because I'll forget people. And once, uh, when I, for my last book, uh, my Aunt Marie had come all the way from Florida, and I forgot to mention her. So I'll just say there's family here, there's my contingent from Canisius College in Buffalo, there's my former foreign editor, Warren Hogue, who kept me straight when I went to places like Syria and Saudi Arabia, there's my star from Paris, Ariane Bernard. Everybody came to help celebrate this, um, this wonderful new book. And of course, my daughter, Gabriella, the real star, who took all of the photographs for uh, my book. Um, yes, I wrote uh, an entire book about a street, and I thought I'd start by showing you three different views of the street. First, this is a view from probably about oh, five, six centuries ago, where the Rue des Martyrs was already the road leading up to Montmartre, the hill at the top of Paris. Uh, then we have another view. Uh, this is a view uh, in the early, early 20th century from a postcard, and this this is exactly the way it looks today. The Rue des Martyrs is that way. The Rue Notre Dame de la Rette, which is the street that I live on, is just uh, to the left. Now we have another slide looking up the street with soccer cur in the background. This is a photograph of Gabby's, but you can get a feel of the street, how this magical view of the street that moves upward towards um, a wonderful, wonderful sight. Now, some people look at the Rue des Martyrs and see a street. Uh, I see, see stories. For me, it's the only street in Paris. Um, it's uh, a celebration of the city in all of its diversity, its rituals, its routines, its permanence, and its transients, its family-owned shops, and its pretty young boutiques. Um, it's not a long street, it's only half a mile long, probably about the same distance from um, Rockefeller Center to Central Park. But yet, it has 200 shops on it um, and small businesses. There are two fish shops on this street. There are 12 bakeries. There are three bookstores. There are 26 restaurants and bistros. There are three cabarets. And then there's, of course, a bathhouse that looks like a Greek temple. Um, it can be perceived as two different streets. You've got the lower part of the street, for those of you who know Paris, that's in the 9th arrondissement, in what was um, the sort of uh, uh, business Paris as Paris was expanding in the beginning of the uh, and middle of the 19th century. And then you've got the top of the street that's in the 18th arrondissement, that's Montmartre. And my husband says that I'm the only person in um, Paris who thinks that this is one street instead of two different worlds. Um, uh, it, this street for me represents what is left of the human intimate side of Paris. And this may sound really corny, but I can never be sad on the Rue des Martyrs. Um, there are espressos to drink, and this is my favorite. Um, this is my favorite uh, cafe. There's Bruno over there in the on the right in, in red. And if you can see the number eight of the door there, we have some Brazilians in the audience. Um, this was the home of someone named Alan Kardec. Did you remember Alan Kardec? Who was the father of spiritism, communicating with the spirits. And um, 
uh, in Brazil, spiritism is considered a religion. There are soap operas and plays and uh, 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 philanthropic groups d dedicated to um, spiritism. So from time to time, we have Brazilian tourists who come and make a pilgrimage to uh, number eight, uh, Rue des Martyrs. It's also where I sit and I look out across the street at about six different shops that are, for me, are kind of like stage sets. Uh, and I watch the world go by. And then I also see the ghosts coming back and forth because this is where Kardec was inspired. So I see Thomas Jefferson, who spent time on the Rue des Martyrs. I see Swedenborg. I see Napoleon. You know, and I even see a couple of popes and kings. It depends, it depends on how much um, uh, of other, something other than coffee I've had to, to drink there. Um, there are also warm, crusty breads to enjoy. And every day at 12.45, I run out to get my tradition, the special baguette, because it's just come hot out of the oven. So who doesn't like this kind of street? And there are people to meet. This is uh, one of my friends who runs the most wonderful bistro at the top of the street, Sebastien, and we'll hear more about him later. There's Michou. Uh, this is uh, Oscar, who's the artistic director, playing um, uh, um, uh, uh, Violetta in La Traviata. Uh, he, this is a, a, a showman in his mid-80s who runs a, a transvestite cabaret. It's more than 50 years old, and it's believed that this was the inspiration for La Cage aux Folles. There's Laurence Gillery. This is a woman who repairs 18th century mercury barometers. She's the only person in Paris who does this. She's been doing it just as her father did before, and she belongs to our street. There's even a century-old bookshop that uh, is run by a wonderful wo woman named Gilbert, uh, and she only opens the bookshop in the afternoon because in the morning, it's not because she's semi-retired, but because she has to spend her mornings reading all the books. She will only sell books that she's read. She has no computer. She has no card catalog. The, uh, the collection of philosophy and, and poetry is all in her head. Uh, merchants have introduced me to their gastronomic passions, like a sweet turnip with yellow stripes named uh, Ball of Gold. And this is Kamel, where I buy my groceries the day that something arrived on the street. Who knows what that is? Exactement. Kale, le chou américain. <laughs> yeah, Kale, Kale came to the Rue des Martyrs. It was a big day, Ariane. They even, he even put a little plant, he even put a little plant uh, uh, with, the, with, the, with the kale in it, and he called it Kale américain. He put it on the side. Yeah, yeah, this is a big, big day. Uh, we have, um, I've learned how to liberate a raw almond by slamming it against the wall, and how to test the um, ripeness of a camembert by pressing my thumb in the middle. Uh, I've also learned about butter. We, you know, we don't buy butter in little aluminum foil packets on the Rue des Martyrs. We buy it in wonderful chunks, and we have a whole variety of it. So over time, I've developed relationships with people. I've learned about the lives of uh, the uh, traditional merchants and artisans, their aches and pains, their vacations, the names and ages of their children. I've heard about the wedding back in Tunisia and the attempted holdup of the, of the jewelry shop. I know who takes a long hot shower and who dyes his hair and who has diabetes and who has a fantasy of meeting Sharon Stone because he's convinced that she's never had any work done. Uh, I know about the mer merchant whose marriage ended in divorce when he discovered his wife in bed with another man. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I know a lot about a lot of things because of the way advice is given freely to every th for everything on the Rue des Martyrs. So that when a mouse uh, took up residence in my apartment, I went out to the neighborhood and asked everybody how to get rid of the mouse. I went to the hardware store and he sold me like uh, three different kinds of traps, which I went home and I put down and then I went back and I said, okay, I've put down the little houses that the mice can go in and I put the little flap uh, snap trap and then I put the glue traps and he said, that's great. He said, did you wear gloves? And I said, you didn't tell me I was supposed to wear gloves. He said, if you didn't wear gloves, it does no good. Throw them all out, start all over again. 
So I had to start all over again, and I then started going to different merchants. And finally, I went to the cheese guy who told me that the only th kind of cheese that you could use in a trap was a vieux comté that costs about 35 euros <laughs> a, a kilo because only the rind on a vieux comté was thick enough to be able to stay in the trap so that the mouse, if it was a smart mouse, couldn't gra grab it away. So you can say to me, well, how do you understand this world? How did you come to like have this relationship with all these people? Well, it all came from my father, and the book is dedicated to my grandfather, who taught me how to cook, and my father, Tony the Food King Sciolino, who ran a little Italian food store in Niagara Falls. And it was there that I learned um, how to sell and how to eat. And um, uh, I take his, my father was a really difficult man, but I learned uh, to much about the good father on the Rue des Martyrs. Um, so this sounds all very kind of sentimental, but this is a street that's serious. It is really steeped in history. Because on this street, the patron saint of France was beheaded. Does anyone remember the name of this, the, the saint? Saint-Denis, thank you, Ariane. It's Saint-Denis, it's Saint-Denis, and his two companions were preaching the Christian gospel, and they were doing such a good job that the Romans took them up the Rue des Martyrs, cut off their heads, and Saint-Denis refused to die. According to legend, he washed his head off in a fountain and carried it up several miles where uh, he finally succumbed to the inevitable, and they built the Saint-Denis Cathedral. It's also the place where St. Ignatius Loyola, in 1534, and six of his companions took their first vows before they created the Jesuits. So I decided that I had to write a letter to the Pope because this is a poor little place, this little crypt, and it deserves to get some attention, right? So I decided that only the Pope coming to Paris, coming to France, you know, the eldest daughter of the church, would um, make it, put it on the map. So I'm going to just read a small excerpt from the book. It was time to write Pope Francis a letter. I had enough going for me to sound respectable. I had been an undergraduate at Canisius College in Buffalo, New York, a Jesuit college. I had covered the Vatican and traveled with the Pope. Best of all, my middle name is Francis. <laughs> I sought guidance from family, friends, and sources. My younger daughter, Gabriella, thought that Nick Dare, an Argentinian friend from high school in Paris, had a family connection. It turns out that his cousin's maternal grandmother had been friends with the Pope. Nick texted her, I can't guarantee anything. I'll give you his cell no phone number. They used to talk all the time and meet up quite often. Alas, Nick's cousin's grandmother was getting old and seemed confused when he called to explain our mission. Not long before, she had written her own letter to Francis requesting human, not divine, intervention. One of her grandsons had been expelled from school, and she'd asked Francis to use his influence to get him accepted into another one. Although Francis had not replied, he'd had a good reason. He was becoming Pope. We assumed he had changed his cell phone number, so I cast a wider net. Elisabetta Povoletto, a friend and a correspondent in the Rome Bureau of the New York Times, sent me the Pope's personal address. Post Office Box 1, Vatican City. Naturally. I told my husband Andy about my plan at breakfast the next morning. When I mentioned the Pope's address, he looked up from his newspaper and asked, is this like writing to Santa Claus? <laughs> ha, I'd show him. I reached out to Philip Palella, an American journalist I knew from my days in Rome who covers the Vatican for Reuters. Go for it, he wrote. He responds to the weirdest of people, so why not you? <laughs> You're going to have to read the book if you want to find out whether the Pope actually responded and whether he's coming. Okay, well, we, uh, this is the crypt. Doesn't it need help? Doesn't, don't you think this crypt needs a little bit of Pope Francis's magic? 
Okay, next. Okay, we have artists, writers, and musicians who lived and worked on this street. Does anyone know who painted this painting? Okay, Degas. Miss Lala at the Cirque Fernando in 1879. This circus was on the Rue des Martyrs. Then we've got another painting, a Renoir, an acrobat at the Cirque Fernando. This, this circus was so famous that when the Musée Picasso, uh, the Picasso Museum reopened in Paris, um, uh, the curators discovered about 200,000 little bits and pieces of paper from Picasso, including little ticket stubs from the Cirque Fernando. So even Picasso came to my street. Emile Zola situated a lesbian dinner club in his novel Nana. Francois Truffaut filmed parts of the 400 Blows on this street. Claude Monet, Paul Gauguin, and Georges Bizet were baptized at the church at the bottom of the street, uh, uh, Notre Dame de Lorette. And just in case you think I'm stuck in the past, Pharrell Williams and Kanye West recently recorded songs in a state-of-the-art music studio on my street. Paradoxically, the street does not belong to monumental Paris, and you won't find it in most guidebooks. Um, it doesn't have the grandeur of the Champs-Élysées or the elegance of the uh, Boulevard Saint-Germain. But I never walk alone on, this, on the Rue des Martyrs, and I do things that I wouldn't say and do anywhere else in the world. And nobody except my daughter Gabriella and her sister Alessandra makes fun of me. This is a view of the street. This is a, another photo that Gabriella took. It's a view looking down towards central Paris and towards s south. And the buildings look exactly the same now as they did in 1840. So it really is a, is a street that escaped the transformation of Paris by Haussmann and is, real, is steeped in the past. Now people ask me if this book is going to ruin the street, if suddenly there's going to be American tourists you know, walking up and down, and I say no, and I'll tell you why. Because of the Notre Dame de Lorette church. This church, you can see Sacre Coeur in the background, is an exact replica of Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome. It's a little bit of Rome, a beautiful bijou jewel of Rome in Paris, and it's in desperate uh, need of uh, repair. There's another view we're going to see of the altar which has just been renovated but most of the rest of the church which is very beautifully decorated very ornate needs restoration so I'm hoping all of you will come to the um, Rue des Martyrs and spread a little bit of American can-do spirit and phil philanthropy there um, now I just want to share with you a little bit of of uh, the people on the Rue des Martyrs. This is Guy, my antique dealer, holding up um, uh, the picture of the, of the cover. I mean, everybody got into the act here. Go ahead. These are the cheesemongers who taught me everything I need to know about cheese. They've been there for 50 years. They still live upstairs uh, from the, tr the cheese shop. This is the Italian, Alexandra in the neighborhood. We've got a little Italian connection now. So at the bottom of the street, there's a shop dedicated to Italian food. These are the two guys um, at, the, um, at, the, at my favorite uh, uh, bistro and cafe in the morning. And this is my butcher, Sebastian. He's the kind of guy when the little old lady comes and she wants to spend 10 minutes talking about the two lamb chops that she's going to buy, he doesn't rush her through, but he says to her, are you going to grill them? Are you going to broil them? Are you going to saute them? Are you going to marinate them? And you're standing behind, and instead of getting nervous the way you do in New York, you just have to go with the flow and maybe learn something about how to cook the perfect lamb chop. Um, now, just to share, this is my door. So anybody who comes and shows up at my door, this is another picture Gabriella took. You come, you know, put the code in. If you really make friends with me, I'll give you the secret code. And I'll come and I'll give you a tour of the Rue des Martyrs, but I'll also give you a tour of m something very special in my building, which is the staircase. This is the only staircase of this epoch that's oval, not round, that exists in Paris. And it's because of the staircase that there is no elevator. 
it, it, it really underscores how uh, aesthetics triumphed over reason. Of course, the guy who led the campaign against the elevator sometimes finds chewing gum stuck in his uh, the lock of his door, and he can't get in and has to call a locksmith, but it's okay. Otherwise, um, uh, we've got peace in the building. So before I end, I just want to do one final reading um, because I ended the book with a party. I decided to give a party for everybody on the street, the people in the 9th arrondissement, the people in the 18th. I brought them all together, the guy who's the caretaker of the church, together with the artistic director of the transvestite cabaret, the fancy patisserie chef Sebastian Godard with the greengrocers, the fishmongers with the butchers, together with the American woman who runs the second hand shop where I took Ariana Huffington to buy a 10 euro hat. So we did a huge potluck. Now the French don't do potlucks because it's just too messy. You know, they need order even in, in a picnic. So I organized a potluck with the help of Sebastien, my, um, the guy you saw kissing his daughter. So I'm just gonna read a little bit from the end. This is Sebastien talking. An American party organized by an American in France for French people with a Puerto Rican American tenor who sang in Italian, he said. Oh, I hired a, a, an opera singer too, a friend of mine, because I thought people might be bored. You know, I thought, what if nobody has anything to talk about? So I thought, well, we'll have a little entertainment. Um, it was out of this world. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? We had the American melting pot on the Rue des Martyrs. His praise was over the top, but I didn't quarrel with him. When I first came to live in Paris in 2002, I had hoped to shed my American skin to become more French. I was set on speaking flawless French with the smoky voice of the actress Jean Moreau and on dressing with the insouciance of the perfect Parisienne Inès de la Fresange. I tried hard to fit in with the rhythm of my former neighborhood off the Rue du Bac in the 7th arrondissement, where refinement, restraint, and politesse reigned. It didn't happen. There were just too many codes to master, and the effort that went into it, which should always be invisible, showed through. On the Rue des Martyrs, the codes don't matter. I am embraced because of, not despite, the absence of a glossy French veneer. Authenticity, my identity as an American with deep roots in a foreign land, trumps pedigree. There is a Sicilian proverb I learned from my father. He learned it from his father. The shepherd saw Jesus only once. The saying refers to the New Testament story of simple shepherds who were watching their flocks when suddenly angels burst on the scene to announce the birth of Christ. It was a magical moment to be embraced and cherished forever. We may not see choirs of angels, but the proverb is a call to revel in every magical moment. The shepherd moment, I call it, as corny as it sounds to my kids. And so it was that this night at Miroir was one of those rare moments in life when all seems right with the world. But it was late, midnight, time to go home. Tomorrow would be another day on the only street in Paris. Thank you. So do we have time for a question or two? Yes, we do. We have time for questions. Who would like to ask a question? <coughs> uh, yes. Oh, you, you, you shouldn't be saying this, Mary. I just saw you. Gosh, which is better, New York or Paris? Uh, depends on the day. Depends if my mother-in-law is if my mother-in-law is in the front row. I have to say New York, right? Because she lives here and she misses us in Paris. <laughs> Paris is where my lovely husband is. <laughs> and New York is where my lovely mother-in-law and daughter are, so I can't possibly answer that question. <laughs> yes, Wayne. So much of New York <coughs> character changes because real estate values change, small shops places. So much of the street seems to be small shops. Is there an issue with that at all? Did everybody, did everybody hear the question? How, how can small shops really survive on the street? Because so so many shops in New York go out because they can't afford to, to stay there. 
um, there's two things. A lot of these merchants have been there forever. And so the they uh, either own the building or they own what they call the lease, and and it's the 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 f prices are fixed and they're controlled, uh, so that someone like Eve, even uh, and Anique Chatagnier, the cheesemongers, have been there for more than 50 years. But the Rue des Martyrs is one of the streets in Paris, um, one of one of many streets in Paris that is zoned artisanal. A certain portion of it is zoned so that if an artisan goes out. Uh, he or she has to be replaced by another artisan. You have to actually make something in the space. So that, uh, in fact, this was the origin of the book. I had started this this book uh, with a news story that I wrote for the New York Times dining section about um, the fish store that went out of business and how everybody was very, very anxious that uh, that another fish store wouldn't wouldn't come in, but that's that's really how it's done. It's done by rent control and um, and laws protectionism. This is why there's three bookstores there, because in France you've got a protectionist law that only allows books to be discounted 5%. So if you go on Amazon to buy a book, it's, it's only 5% reduction. So why not go and make friends with your bookseller? Anybody else? I must have just been so brilliant, huh? You know, no, yes, yes. Was there anybody who anybody who inspired me to think about writing this book? Yeah. That's a really interesting question because this almost wasn't a book. I had to fight to make this a book, and it was the first, I've written four books, and this was the first book that was really a hard sell because it was so counterintuitive and different and small. You know, my other books all went large, and this one went deep and small. And and so it's a very personal book, um, and it's it's it, you know I fell in love with the street, and I wanted to share the same feeling with others. But it's almost a book in spite of itself. Yes, it's Helen. Ariane, what do you think? Is that street unique, or are there many other streets in Paris like it? Ar Ariane's mother lives in the neighborhood. There are other market streets, are other market streets yes. But this one is mine. You see, that's the difference. There's, uh, there are other market streets, but I know everybody on the street. They know me. I mean, I can't walk up and down the street without everybody knowing me by name. And it's so wonderful. Here I come to New York. I go into Trader Joe's. The first time I go in, someone cuts in front of me. And I said, excuse me, um, I think I was behind the woman who's in front of you. She didn't even reply. You know, I mean, we got to do something to bring the spirit of the Rue des Martyrs to this city, you know, where you stand in line for 10 minutes and you might learn a, a recipe or two while you're standing there. You might meet, meet a friend, you might meet your former, your, your next husband, you know, or your, but um, we don't have this spirit quite here. <laughs> Helen, Helen was there two years ago, and she didn't find everyone that wonderful. Helen, Helen, come to my street. You know, I'll take you to my street, and we'll find, and everyone will be wonderful. Okay, what? You have to work on it. Well, Gabby, why don't you? Why don't you? Why don't I turn this microphone over to Gabby? Come on, over to Gabby. No, just for a minute, Gabby. Tell uh, just a little bit about. I'm prepared. <laughs> tell, 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 tell us a little bit about the street. Just your your magic of the street. What do you think about the street? Well, obviously, I spent a lot of time with everyone because I would stand in their shops for hours at a time taking pictures of them, and they um, were very hospitable to me. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, they're great. Uh, it's same thing. It takes, like, um, hours to walk up the street because mom will stop in every single store and talk to every single person, so sometimes we have to, I make her go a roundabout way if we're in a rush so that um, <laughs> we, we get moving quicker. But Gabby, just say, t maybe talk just a little bit about the difference between our old neighborhood, which was very kind of elegant and, and elitist, and, and, and our new neighborhood. Um, well, on off the Rue du Bac, you couldn't uh, there were it was all white old women wearing fur coats and people out 
you know, doing their fancy shopping. And on Sundays, it was like a dead zone because everyone's inside having their family lunches, where as the Rue des Martyrs, on Sundays, it closes off the street to any pedestrians, or to cars, and um, only pedestrians can walk up and down the street. Uh, yeah, so, and, and all the merchants put their produce out on the street to like lure people in and such, so. Yes, and, and once a month there is a free book exchange, and nobody can believe it because um, the, a volunteer group comes and just hands out books, and and you don't even have to bring your your old books, although it's encouraged, and and people who don't know the street suddenly come upon, upon this like a big crowd around all these piles of books and say, what's going on? And they say, free books, free books, and that that just makes it fun. It just makes it fun. Yes, Wayne. <laughs> Well, it's it, now there's this extraordinarily fancy patisserie, uh, pastry shop, patissier, and that ma has made it more um, uh, uh, desirable for people from other neighborhoods to come. But it's mostly a neighborhood. It's mostly a neighborhood street. Yeah. Yes, Warren, my old my old boss. <laughs> hey, the last time I saw you in Paris, I was based in London for the New York Times, and I came across and we had lunch, and you said, "What would you like to eat?" And um, boy, the possibilities of having lunch in London. Uh, in, in Paris. Remit. But I, I was thinking about French food from other parts of the world where the French had so much influence. So I said a Vietnamese restaurant. I mean, went to a Vietnamese restaurant. On the Rue de Martyr, if I wanted to see evidence of Francophone Africa, if I wanted to see Vietnam, that was in, in the food and the stores, would I help it there? You would not find Francophone Africa uh, there, but you would find the green. Gr you would find the Tunisian greengrocers, and you'd find the Algerian um, uh, um, uh, 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 cafe owners, and you'd find a mi blend of Isl Muslims and Jews. I mean, there's a the Tunisian Jews run the um, flower shop, and and and. Um, and uh, Guy Lelouch, the antique dealer, uh, we become so close that he even came over to our Passover Seder uh, for dinner with his daughter and, and granddaughter. So it's more of, a, of, a, of an ethnic mix with North African uh, and, and, and then, then it would be uh, Sub-Saharan African, except for the nannies, because the nannies, this is becoming a more gentrified neighborhood now, and you know, 50 years ago there were more prostitutes than kids on the street, and now there's, the prostitutes have all moved into massage parlors, and, um, and there's lots of kids on the street, and the maids, the nannies tend to be from places like Cameroon or Mali, so that's the, that's the, the sub-Saharan African. The transvestite club is one of the, you know I for years I did I walked by this place really quickly because I thought I was sort of expecting like tourists from weird countries to come <laughs> drunken pouring out on the streets and then I went one night and it's like PG-13 you know there's no body parts that show they use all this foam rubber to cover things up but you know it's it's really good you know when you see Cher you really think it's Cher and you see Edith Piaf and there she is it's really it's really scary. They're so good, and Michu exists. You know, he's he he's always on the street, and he's in his in his uh, mid eighties, and he dresses in electric blue, and even his shoes and his eyeglasses are blue. And um, he, when you come, Warren, I won't take you to a Vietnamese restaurant. I think we were the only people in the restaurant that day, but I will take you to Michu if you'd like to go. <laughs> yes, Vicky. No, I don't live on the Rue des Martyrs. I live around the corner on the Rue Notre Dame de la Rette. To live on the Rue des Martyrs, you know, the spirit of the Rue des Martyrs is extends 500 feet away. It's, it's. Believe me, I'm, I'm of the, I, I, I'm, I'm of the, of the neighborhood. So it's, it's perfectly fine. It's close enough. And also, the, the, my street is um, uh, um, Notre Dame de Lorette. It's named after the church, but there also were women who were called Lorette, uh, who were the, um, in the 19th century, were the streetwalkers, who um, uh, were independent uh, 
uh, entrepreneurs. They didn't have to work in um, in bordellos, regulated bordellos, but they were able to to do their own thing, and they were welcomed in the church. So, th which is at the corner of the my street in Rue des Martyrs. So it's 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 my world. Yes. I'm going to just tell you something, Geoffroy. If you took a trip to the Rue des Martyrs in one year, you're going to see a lot of things that are changing because the, the street is gentrifying extremely quickly and, and I hope it keeps its character. I mean, even since we've lived there and we've only lived there for a few years, there has been a, an, um, a shop that is devoted only to selling Madeleine pastries. There's another shop that is only selling honey products. There's another shop that only sells olive oil products. And it, it's it's nice that these are still food shops, but they're very upscale shops. And what I hope is that that uh, there will be somebody who takes over the business for the artisan who makes who repairs mercury driven barometers and for the the cheesemongers and the fishmongers and the um, the joy of the arc of my book is that at the end of the book there is another fishmonger who came in to replace the guy who retired and we're hoping to keep this spirit but I think the Rue des Martyrs may be a different place in five, ten, certainly twenty years. Yes, Mary. Oh, Rose's Bakery. Yeah, yeah. Rose, yeah, Rose Bakery. Yes, which is a wonderful. She's a. Um, it's sort of like a British um, quiche and uh, uh, crumble kind of place with very with all sorts of organic vegetables and fruits. And that was really the first upscale shop on the Rue des Martyrs about twelve years ago to to open. I know there's an offshoot in New York now. She's written a book now. I mean, it's, it's, but she's still a nice person. She really is. She's lovely. You know, she's a, a, Italian, even though she was born in South Africa. She's got an Italian name, so. Yes? I really love what you said about keeping the spirit of the Rue de Martyrs, and I'm wondering what each of us can take away Well, I have to tell you, what we can do is talk to anybody about anything. There are people in New York who think I am totally crazy because I start talking, and poor Gabriella has to deal with this. She says, we go places, we go into a shop, and she says, Mom, I'll go into the shop with you as long as you promise you will not start a conversation with this woman about her whole, her whole life. Um, but this is, this is what it, it is. It literally is, you know, when I was in um, Citarella's yesterday buying fish, this woman was when I wasn't standing in line, you know, and I don't know why it is in New York. Everybody cuts in front of me, and she um, she just started ordering, and I said, "Excuse me, but I think this is a line here." She doesn't say a word, and I say to the woman in the counter, "Is there a line here?" Well, not really. And so she does her ordering, and then she um, she looks at me, and I look at her, and I say, "You're welcome." And she said, oh, thank you. And I said, oh, fine. I don't live in New York, but is this, you know. She says, well, you know, I just didn't realize you were ahead of me. And then we started talking, and I told her I liked her coat. I told her she had beautiful skin, you know. <laughs> you can tell any woman of any age she has beautiful skin, and she'll be nice to you, you know. <laughs> I've, met, I've, met, I've met guys on the subway. I mean, it's really easy to meet people in New York. You just have to act a little crazy. And that's the, that's the spirit of the Rue de Martyr. Just be out there and talk to anybody. Yep. Yes. Yes. I mean, I'm Carol Gerbat, but I lived there for years. I lived right near there, so, so far back. And I didn't think it was the greatest area. <laughs> I, mean, I lived a little further down in the 18th. And, but it brings back to myself that the difference between New York and Paris, even though I go back and forth. And I'm just so into this New York thing. You know, people might say, I've got a business, I've got that. And just hearing you talk about it, may not be that street in the ocean, but it's definitely that sort of European thing that's very attached to your neighborhood, where you live, and it sort of you know, locked into this being a frame of reference to that. You don't have that in New York. It's not the Anglo-Saxon mentality, but sometimes you get a little bit of that neighborhood. If 
anywhere in America. Well, thank you. I, I mean, I, I look. There's a there's a dark side to this book too. Don't think that it's all just me skipping up the Rue des Martyrs, you know, in my, you know, you know, uh, high heels and uh, you know, you know, with a little poodle, um, you know, <laughs> on a, on a chain. Um, uh, uh, y you know, it was. Uh, uh, one of the Charlie Hebdo guys lives on the Rue des Martyrs, who was one of the survivors. So since the uh, attacks last um, January against Charlie Hebdo and the Jewish supermarket, we've had armed um, paramilitary guys uh, stationed in front of his apartment. So it's not in the in the school. Oh yes, in the school. There's a school on the on the Rue des Martyrs too, a high school where there's a plaque. And the fact Gabby took a picture of the plaque in the book, where um, 19 girls um, uh, during the it was a girls' school during the occupation were take were deported and uh, lost their lives. And one of the teachers. I mean, the, this neighborhood in the Ninth Arrondissement, like the Marais, was was an old Jewish neighborhood and uh, and suffered um, during the occupation. So, um, but it's even more reason why my spirit, which is just, um, you know, I am happy on the street. That's all I can say, and 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 it's because it's um, there's it's just it, you're able to be a little bit crazy, and a little bit just out there, and that's fun. I mean, life's too short. We're all too serious. Maybe on that note, we should um, we should end and. Uh, and uh, take the spirit of the Rue des Martyrs with us and s skip arm in arm out of here into the <laughs> night, cool night air, huh? I'd love to sign some books, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.